fantastic intro music. Again, just sitting here. It's adorable to do intro. So I made that one. How oh, fantastic. Northern uh, I thought he got really excited when he learned how to do editing. So, uh, <laughs> which has really been very, very useful. Um, hello, Academy. We are here for another session. Um, I am Chloe Farahar. I am a white woman with a shaved head, giant glasses, and kind of a rose colored dress. And I'm sitting in my office and I'm joined today by JJ. And I am uh, JJ Mudridge. I am a white non-binary person with silver purple hair and a mint green shirt that does not match at all with my red lipstick. And I'm it sitting does. in the study. <laughs> Red and green are fantastic colours together. Are they? I was scared I'd look like Christmas. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> no, fantastic colours together. Um, we have had the lovely JJ on before, um, and we'll still do our typical thing just for people who maybe have not heard JJ speak of who JJ is and when they discovered they were autistic. Um, just to make people aware who maybe weren't sure what this topic um, is that we're covering today, there are some trigger warnings um, because we are discussing applied behavioral analysis. Um, and largely it's gonna be sort of presentation based. So we have had JJ on before talking um, from a very personal perspective of experience in ABA, which was so, so valuable. And then it was a really good idea to have um, JJ come back on and do sort of, well, you can explain. So what's the idea for the presentation? So I basically have a synopsis of a lot of the research out there that shows that, I mean, some, some studies are left out for the sake of like keeping it within an hour or so. It's something I can info dump about for hours if, if you let me, but uh, I would like to keep it concise for viewers who may have attention differences. Um, it's basically a, a synopsis of um, what ABA is, why it's it's actually dangerous. Um, I have a brief bit on like, who am I and why you should listen to me particularly about this. Um, and then a little bit of guidance for, you know, parents or caretakers or whoever for looking for um, other therapies other than ABA that may be less harmful and how to find or um, how to vet your ther therapists to see if they are neurodiversity forming or just kind of using neurodiversity as a buzzword. And that's really, really important and useful because in lots of family spaces, you know, online, you know, parents do say, well, if not ABA, then what? And that's really, you're going to be covering some of that sort of discussion, which is really, really useful. Um, and also some of that argument about, well, do we need intervention? So that's- Do we need therapy at all, merely because we're autistic? Um, yeah. So, but that's a different conversation in the sense is, of we is. can discuss, you know, there's a difference between needing therapy because you've experienced trauma and have mental health concerns, but we're going to be discussing um, and have a little bit of discussion after the presentation about, you know, well, do we actually need therapy or intervention purely for being autistic? That's, that's a whole other thing. Um, if you already have a bit in here about who you are, would you like to leave that bit for now and just um, remind people and for the new people who maybe haven't seen you, just when you discovered you were autistic? So I was identified as autistic around age two and a half or three. Um, two and a half. <laughs> and I've said this before, that's actually quite young for a number of our guests. It is, it is, because I feel like a lot of the the self-advocacy community is like a lot of really late diagnosed autistics. Um, but also like being assigned female at birth, I, it's, it's also like really, really early for that too. Yes, actually, yes. Can you remind us, if you don't mind, how old you are at the moment? I'm 31 years old. 31, yeah. So like you say, given your age actually being if you were assigned female at birth and being diagnosed as an autistic person very young, mm -hmm. that's actually not that common. Um, maybe we're getting there in some segments of society yeah. and some societies at recognizing non-typical presentations and different genders can be autistic. Um, but yeah, in terms of your age and things, um, yeah, that was quite, like, quite young. I had a student refer to me as middle-aged the other day. And I, was like, <laughs> I, need to, I need to leave. <laughs> I'll see you next week. 
I think it was the most painful when I was maybe in my twenties or something, and I got like maddened or something. Oh, like, man. One day, like I'm at the grocery store, and they're like, "Ma'am," I was like. I don't see any grandmothers here. It is not me. I am not. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. People, yeah, one of those things. Like, how do we do that without <laughs> either offending in terms of age or actually misgendering people as well? <laughs> like, that's the whole thing. Um, so, yeah, so shall we jump? Do you want to jump right in? Because sure. we're going to take some time with this. And then hopefully we won't have too much discussion because we had a lot of fantastic discussion last time, um, but a little bit of discussion after on if I think, oh my God, I need to talk about that. that JJ brought up, so I'm not going to interrupt you um, while you're while you're speaking, um, but I will be here. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be um, the assistant who changes the the slides. <laughs> right. well, hopefully, like my computer doesn't just crash because I'm like the only autistic one. Like, I can build you a truck from scratch if you want, but like try to get me to use my smartphone, and all bets are off. Um, so I mean, I can I, I could pretend and like just wing it but i don't i think i'd rather let you go <laughs> to do it <laughs> do you want to pop up the first slide? there we go okay there we go. Right. so um just navigating autism therapies for parents of newly diagnosed youth so um next slide if you will chloe sorry i was just gonna i was just taking off the um the war, uh, trigger warning just so it wasn't in the way of the screen oh, there we go so uh before we start let's just go over what we'll be talking about uh uh, quickly, this is a simplified lecture, which is why I usually listen to me. I'm having a bit of problems with your mic. I have no idea what's happened there. Oh no, is it is it cutting out because I have more than one thing out? I don't know. It went really really fast. It was like you were a I don't know a gremlin or something. It was really, <laughs> um, Jokes on you, I am. Can anyone say in the comment section if it was me or if it, if you all also heard that too? I'm hoping it won't keep doing it. Um, seeing if anyone says anything. Sure. Yes, okay. I don't know if that's, yes, it was just me. Or... <laughs> that's fine, we'll, we'll keep going. We'll give it another go. Okay. Sorry, um, can you start that again? Sorry, JJ. Start again. So uh, who am I in? Why should you listen to me? Uh, reframing diagnosis because I know how scary diagnosis to my parents and I have good news for it's you. It's doing it again. It's doing it again. Interesting. To... ABA and is it still doing it? No, it's really weird. It's every time you stop. Have you got like, are you doing anything in terms of the, somebody says in a good way? It sounds like a gremlin. <laughs> um, I, am, I am a gremlin. It's just me. I don't know. Are you having to press anything while you're talking, or I'm it's having literally to scroll just down the sounds? Maybe I'll just scroll ah, down. you're scrolling. Is it doing that? Yeah. Um, okay, should, we'll give it. We'll give it another go. Should I keep going? L lovely. This is what happens when it's live. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, who am I, and why should you listen to me? Um, reframing diagnosis. Feeling how scary diagnosis. No, nope. it's definitely um, scrolling. Avoiding it. It's... I'm not scrolling. Oh no! Why is it doing that? That's very bizarre. Should I just try to keep going? ABA and avoiding it will likely be the most dense of this, and arguably the most important. Um, the gold standard of autism therapies is actually very dangerous. Um, does someone need therapies just because they are autistic? The short answer is no. Uh, sometimes yes, but it's a bit more complicated than that entirely. Um, and deciding on therapies, because what therapies you choose will be based on identifying needs rather than just being autistic. Um, let's see. As I mentioned in my first slide, uh, my name is JJ Mudridge. I am many things, uh, including a hobbyist CrossFit athlete, a multiply published poet, an academic tutor, a uh, competitive rhythm gamer, among other things, uh, but the label I'm most proud of is autistic. I was diagnosed as quote unquote low functioning, uh, autistic around age two and a half, and I was non-speaking until I was around 12. And during my childhood, I was actively and openly mourned by my parents, denied routine childhood experiences because of my neurology and told everything that I couldn't or wasn't allowed to do. 
Um, you see, I was like your child. I've been autistic and been autistic for culture um, for over 30 years. And I'm heavily involved in the neurodiversity movement. I run the page Not Another Autistic Advocate where I attempt to dispel cultural myths about autism and autistics. Um, and gently, in most cases, um, guide parents towards helping autistic youth become the best versions of themselves. So you could say that I'm an autism expert, not because I have degrees in, you know, um, you know, pathologizing therapies, but because I am autistic. Um, and because I was diagnosed autistic very early on, I endured almost 12 years of applied behavior analysis, uh, which is an abusive therapy we'll talk a little bit about later, which stole my childhood and the resulting CPTSD stole my adulthood. Here's a picture of me because I'm kind of cute sometimes. Um, so reframing diagnosis. An autism diagnosis can be scary for parents of newly diagnosed youth, especially neurotypical parents of newly diagnosed youth because the rhetoric surrounding autism and autistics, but I have good news for you. And it's not that your child can recover because autism is in a tragedy and autistic neurology can be joyful. Um, so the DSM-5, which is what we use in the US um, as opposed to the ICD, uh, posits that autistics lack social skills, emotional intelligence, and reciprocity. In actuality, autistics have a different set of social skills. Our, our social skills do not look like neuromajority social skills, but they're just as real and, and Im important. Um, they're just often overlooked because there are more neurotypicals than there are autists. Um, in a recent study done called Autistic Peer-to-Peer -peer Information Transfer is Highly Effective, Autistics and neurotypicals were paired up with each other. Um, so there were groups of just neurotypical groups, just autistic groups, and then interneurotype groups um, comprised of both autists and neurotypicals. And they were told to communicate details of a story. The study showed that information transferred as effectively, and in some cases, uh, some autistic people might argue more effectively because of our direct communication style. Um, between autists and autists as much as between neurotypicals. Um, and the reason this is important is because the dominant narrative of autism reports falsely that we have social deficits. Um, autists have been denying this framework since the 1960s and, and likely before, but finally we have some research backing up what we've been saying for decades. Um, so here are some excerpts um, from that study that we found that autistic people share information as well as non-autistic people do with other non-autistic people do. However, when there are mixed groups of autistic and non-autistic people, much less information is shared. Uh, participants were also asked how they felt they had got on with the other person in the interaction. The people in mixed groups also experienced lower rapport with the person they were sharing the story with. Uh, the finding is important because it showed that autistic people have the skills to share information well with one another and experience good rapport, and that there are selective problems when autistic and non-autistic people are interacting. And um, the quality of transfer of information within all autistic chains did not differ from information transfer in non-autistic chains, indicating that autistic people's abilities to share information and build rapport do not significantly differ from their non-autistic counterparts. Um, so perhaps the most egregious of the cultural myths surrounding autism is that we lack empathy. Um, that, whoop, oops, that autistics lack theory of mind uh, was a theory posited by autism researcher, despised by autistic communities, um, Simon Baron Cohen, or as I like to call him, Simon Barely Coherent. Um, that we lack theory of mind has been repeatedly and thoroughly debunked many times over, but I will give you one study that analyzes several failures of that claim. Um, so autistics and researchers, both autistic and neurotypical, have been fighting to correct the claim that autists lack theory of mind for many, many years. Um, this study in particular um, reviews the failures of the false assertion on five counts, which are failures of specificity, failures 
of universality, failures of replication, and failures of convergent validity. That is four. I put the wrong number. All right. Um, and here is an excerpt from that study, which says, the claim that autistic people lack a theory of mind, that they fail to understand that other people have a mind or that they themselves have a mind pervades psychology. Um, this article A reviews the empirical evidence that fails to support the claim that autistic people are uniquely impaired, much less that all autistic people are universally impaired on theory of mind tasks. It highlights original findings that have failed to replicate documents multiple instances in which the various theory of mind tasks fail to relate to each other and fail to account for autistic traits, social interaction and empathy, and summarizes the large body of data collected by researchers working outside the theory of mind rubric that fails to support assertions made by researchers working inside the theory of mind rubric and concludes the claim that autistic people lack a theory of mind is empirically questionable and societally harmful. Interestingly enough, the conclusion goes on to say that the claim that autistic people lack a theory of mind is so entrenched that when existing measures fail uh, to support the claim, researchers create new measures and gives concrete examples of this affront to, to science. Um, overall, the study is great and one that I would highly recommend reading. Uh, any, anybody should read it. So, this is by no means an exhaustive coverage of neurodivergent culture. Um, I should I should do something on just like a primer for, for neurodivergent culture at some point. Um, but I did wanna quickly cover a couple other aspects of the differences between the two paradigms and the approaches to autism. Um, the pathology paradigm posits that autism is a tragedy that needs to be eradicated, but the neurodiversity paradigm sees autism as a natural and normally occurring expression of human neurology. All brains are different, right? Uh, autistic brains are different in specific ways. Um, we're not just this collection, this, this, this human amalgam of uncouth behaviors. Um, uh, our brains are different in specific ways that include our you know, neuronal branching, the way our amygdalas develop, the connectivity between the lobes of our brain. Um, and wanting a cure is, is wanting to change the way our brain is quite literally shaped. Um, something that can't be done without fundamentally altering the person as a whole. Um, everything I do, I do and experience autistically. If you cured my autism, you wouldn't have a neurotypical JJ. You would have an entirely different person. Um, so when you tell us you want to cure us, you're wishing that a stranger who is easier to love would move behind our eyes, um, which is just cruel in, in, in every conceivable way, and I shouldn't need to outline why that's cruel. So lastly, let's talk a little bit about the puzzle piece because I have no chill on this subject. Um, while it is the most widely used iconography to represent an autistic neurotype, most autistics hate it and view it as a symbol of hate. Um, the puzzle piece as an icon to represent autistic neurology was created in the mid 60s by the National Autistic Society. The original logo featured a crying child in the middle. Um, its origins are undeniably ableist and a quick Google search will tell you that. Um, as it was meant to imply that we suffer from a puzzling condition as a whole and that we are puzzling people. Um, later, Autism Speaks, which I, I I would like to think that everybody at this point knows that it's a eugenicist hate group, um, picked up their iconography and with the image of the blue puzzle piece that's pretty much come, become synonymous with autism branding these days. Um, autistic people reject the puzzle piece iconography to represent our neurotype on the premise that it feeds into the idea that we are missing pieces uh, that neurotypicals aren't or that we are incomplete. Um, it, it's, you know, rooted in pathology paradigms that tell us that we need to be cured or solved like a puzzle. And, you know, the primary colors that are usually used alongside it perpetuate the idea that we are just forever children. Um, in fact, a non-autistic parent member of the National Autistic Society had this to say about the puzzle piece, which was, quote, the puzzle piece t is so effective because it tells us something about autism, that our children are handicapped by puzzling conditions. This isolates them from normal human contact. 
uh, therefore they do not fit in. Scientific studies have actually showed that puzzle piece imagery evokes negative cognitive associations, um, whether or not it is in relation to autism branding or neutral, neutral product branding. Um, so what can you use instead? The rainbow infinity symbol, uh, which was iconography created by and for autistics uh, to represent the diversity in human neurology or the infinity symbol in red or gold, red to counter the you know lighted up blue narrative that's rooted in the neuromisogynist myth that only boys can be autistic, or gold because you know chemical symbol um, for gold is AU. So ap applied behavior analysis and avoiding it, and the end avoiding it is going to be key here. So Ole Ivar Lovas. Um, the pioneer of ABA also pioneered gay conversion therapy. Um, ABA is rooted in aversives, including slaps, electric shocks. And um, the originator of ABA, Lovas, had this to say about autistic youth, which is, quote, you start pretty much from scratch when you work with an autistic child. You have a person in the physical sense, they have a hair, a nose, a mouth, but they are not people in the psychological sense. Um, one way to look at the job of helping autistic kids is to see it as a matter of constructing a person. You have the raw materials, but you have to build the person. Is this what you want someone to say about your autistic child, that they're less than human? Like, and this is the view that continues to this day in ABA, that the behavior Lovas called self-stimulatory and what autistics ourselves call stimming are arbitrary without purpose. Um, stims are artistic body language, uh, they're autistic communication, and to tell an autistic person not to communicate autistically is to tell an autistic person not to communicate. Um, many, many ABAers claim to focus on redirecting stims to, you know, uh, less socially isolating ways, or however they phrase it. Um, for example, redirecting a hand flap, which is one of my favorite stems, um, to a foot tap. But if my foot itches and I'm told to scratch my ear instead because it's less noticeable, my foot still itches. Um, and if you redirect stems into something more socially acceptable, which might I ask, socially acceptable by whose measure, um, you may be missing what we're trying to communicate. Um, so here's another one more quote from Lovas, which was those who say um, that ABA doesn't seek to suppress stims, which can you go back to the previous slide real quick, Chloe? Um, which is since the emphasis of our treatment program is to make the child look as neat and appropriate as possible, we attempt to suppress the more severe or grotesque forms of self-stimulatory um, by the use of aversive stimuli. Lovis said this to the National, Autistic, National Society for Autistic Children, which is now the Autism Society of America. And also, um, it is obviously very embarrassing for people in the company of a child who jumps up and down, ritualistically flaps his arms in front of his face. Such behavior socially isolates the child and embarrasses the parents, uh, which he also said to the Autism Society of America. Um, Let's see. So perspectives on ABA. ABA is lauded by the parents and, and those who administer it. I mean, of, of course. And it's framed with lots of pretty words about what ABA claims to teach. This was taken from one of, you know, endless ABA, pro-ABA websites that quote, the goals of individuals participating in ABA um, are to improve language capabilities and other communication skills, limit negative behavioral patterns, improve learning outcomes, and help develop social skills, among many others. For Audis, especially those of us who have been through it, like myself, uh, ABA is an initialism for abuse but allowed. So while ABA is praised by professionals, it has scientific links to post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, in a study done by Henry Kupferstein, research showed autistics exposed to ABA had a 46% higher chance of meeting criteria for PTSD than control groups, um, which is almost half. And while that number may seem like it's not a lot to a casual observer, 
if a therapy was causing trauma in just under half of its participants, uh, who I should add have no choice in their participation in the therapy other one as well, um, chances are it wouldn't be marketed as therapy at all. I mean, unless those participants are autistic. And here are some excerpts from Cooperstein's study. From the abstract, we have this study noted PTSS in nearly half of ABA exposed participants, while non-exposed controls had a 72% chance of being asymptomatic. ABA satisfaction ratings for caregivers average neutral or mild satisfaction. In contrast, adult satisfaction with ABA was lower on average and tended to take on either extremely low or extremely high ratings. Exposure to ABA predicted a higher rate and more severe PTSS in participants, but the duration of exposure did not affect satisfaction with the intervention of caregivers. And from the findings portion of the study, um, Kupferstein said that nearly half, uh, which was 46%, um, of the ABA exposed respondents met the diagnostic threshold for PTSD. And extreme levels of severity were recorded in 47% of the affected subgroup. Uh, respondents of all ages who were exposed to ABA were 86% more likely to meet uh, PTSD criteria than the respondents who were not exposed to ABA. Adults and children both had an increased chances, 41 and 130% respectively, of meeting the PTSD criteria if they were exposed to ABA. Both adults and children without ABA exposure had a 72% chance of reporting um, no PTSS. And at the time of the study, 41% of caregivers reported using ABA-based interventions. Uh, another excerpt states that in adults, the severity of symptoms was positively correlated with the duration of exposure to the intervention, such that severity scores tended to increase by half of a severity threshold with every additional increment of 5% lifetime exposure. Um, this translates to a prediction that for every increment of 5% of their lifetime exposure to ABA, the individual's severity score will increase by half the severity threshold. Um, the average 18-month-old autistic child who is exposed to 40 hours of ABA per week will be expected to surpass the severe threshold of the PTSD criteria within six weeks, given the 1.5% lifetime exposure. Um, the average three-year-old autistic child who's exposed to 20 hours of ABA per week will be expected to surpass the severe threshold of the PTSD criteria um, within five months of ABA exposure. And the average five-year-old autistic child who's exposed to 10 hours of ABA per week will be expected to surpass the severe threshold of the PTSD criteria before their seventh birthday. In another study, how much compliance is too much compliance is long-term ABA therapy abuse, which is just the most on the nose uh, title for a study, right? I love it. Um, researchers looked at the long-term consequences of long-term exposure to applied behavior analysis. Um, and I have excerpts from that study right here. And oh my God, the writing is so small, I can hardly read it. So let me just lean in real quick here. <laughs> From the introduction of that study is um, a discussion. Oh, thank you. A discussion of some of the issues. Yeah, unfortunately it won't let me do it. Uh, but I think that would be more frustrating because it can only zoom in in one particular way. I apologize that I'm such a Luddite. Um, with the underlying theory of ABA is the current application is conducted, especially with regard to lower functioning. I put that in scare quotes myself um, and nonverbal autistic individuals namely the curtailing of soothing, stimming behaviors, um, operant conditioning behaviors, principles that research has continued to prove is not apt for usage with autistic individuals, as well as the unintended and damaging consequences, such as prompt dependency, psychological abuse, and compliance that tend to pose high costs on former ABA students as they move into adulthood. Um, another excerpt is, regrettably, the damage done by ABA therapy through this kind of intensive conditioning goes beyond adult reliance and learned helplessness. Uh, the little, there is little evidence of prompts fading in order to decrease dependency and encourage students to respond to other people in, with more naturally occurring cues. Um, in one particular study, dependence was even observed on playgrounds when a child could clearly engage in a task or play autonomously, uh, but hesitated by it when a paraprofessional was, was near. 
Uh, the proximity, constant prompting, and intensive conditioning produced various issues that proponents of ABA therapy and child advocates in general have failed to study. Um, research has indicated many problems with the premises behind ABA and various similar interventions, yet longitudinal research examining the lives of adults who've been subjected to this conditioning since childhood is few and far between. Uh, these excerpts are terrifying um, because it shows not only what ABAers are doing to us, but it also shows that society as a whole doesn't care the impact of what is happening to us personally as, as people, as individuals. Nobody has studied the psychological and long-term consequences in ABA on us of the very population that is being subjected to it. And can you remind us how long this therapy or this intervention has been used and available? Oh my goodness, um, I believe since the mid 70s. I, I need to double check that statistic. But e even so, that's they've had plenty of time to oh, yes. do decent research to look at if there's any good outcomes right. long, longitudinally, so long term for this. And this is, this is good outcomes as defined by the people being subjected to it because the mm. good outcomes uh, for neurotypical parents and caregivers is does my child sit down and shut up? Um, it, it, I'm, I, I was going to take that back, but I'm not going to take but that back. But you don't back. have any of that. I mean, we get frustrated that there's not enough research into CBT in terms of its longitudinal effects, etc. But actually, there's quite a bit. So how is there? There's none, really. Right, just, for, just ABA. for ABA. And, and, and not important. Right, because that's that's how the, the cognitive framework we have around ABA is that it works because we're listening to parents and caregivers and not the people who then grow into adults which I, I will get into. <laughs> and somebody said, no, don't take it back. It's true. <laughs> yes. Um, so another excerpt from the study is that research has also indicated the psychological impact of the external reward sim sim systems and the impact of produced compliance. Detrimental effects are noted after the introduction of rewards, such as reduced motivation, reduced intrinsic interest, and reduced performance quality in both typical and non-typical children. Additionally, the reward expectation even lingers after changing the target task and the environment, indicating that the only thing that's being generalized is low motivation and the need for rewards. Uh, this excerpt shows us that even typically developing children subject to ABA methods, which at least in the US public school system is pervasive, um, they have poorer long-term outcomes. And uh, again, because this study is so good, um, spouses of individuals with then called Asperger's syndrome who were exposed to conditioning, conditioning used in ABA disclosed living with the consequences of prompt dependency and identified lack of self-motivation as a constant source of stress within their relationships. Um, these spouses also identified as filling a parent or caregiver role instead of a partner role. Additionally, prompting was found to be embedded within most that couples interactions in generally permeated their relationship. Other research indicates that prompt dependence has been found to inhibit or prevent the development of age appropriate social relationships and interpersonal skills in children, which also contributes to lack of motivation and unsuccessful learning. This excerpt in particular is near and dear to my heart as, as a married autistic adult. Um, I know that I'm prompt dependent to this day, something that my spouse navigates so gracefully uh, but it didn't have to be this way. ABA claims to aid in learning, but this research shows the exact opposite, that long-term exposure actually impedes learning and motivation. And one of the most beautiful things about an autistic neurology is our intrinsic motivation. Um, so ABA purports to teach us social skills, self-regulation, speech, and, and more. But what it really teaches is autistic masking. The stated goal of ABA, according to the man who pioneered it, O. Ivar Lovas, is to make autistic individuals indistinguishable from their peers. That's literally the definition of masking. Um, my mask looks a little like this in conversation. You know, smile, run intro scripts, look in their eyes, don't flap, don't spin, don't rock, use tonal inflections. Nope, that is too much tonal inflection. Smile, don't look towards that sound. Uh, direct the conversation towards them. Keep your hands by your sides. What does that facial expression mean? No, wait, you can't ask that. That's uncouth. 
Uh, look in their eyes. Don't flap. Keep personal anecdotes to a minimum. Add infinitum. It's it's exhausting. And I I come out of social interactions drained and needing to recover for for days afterwards. Uh, so much of my cognitive bandwidth is used up when I mask that I don't have the energy to do much else. So why even do it? Because whether we were taught in ABA to mask or, you know, we didn't have formal ABA and it's parents and caregivers who didn't accept our authentic autistic selves um, or a lifetime of exclusion and ostracization um, by the neurotypical world for our autistic traits, the world created this need for us to mask if we want to, you know, somehow get along in it. Um, neuro majorities perceive difference as a threat, as something to be eradicated. Um, it's not an active choice, it's a defense mechanism and a survival strategy, um, especially for autistic professionals who need to conform or to corporate or institutionalized environments, um, which makes me think about my time in te as a classroom teacher. Um, it isn't deception, it's, it's surviving in a world that doesn't accept Otis as we are, that routinely excludes us at every turn, while on the surface calling for our acceptance and inclusion, which is like, I, I can't express how much of a brain fuck that is. Uh, the problem with masking is that it causes depression. It leads to burnout. It can make us unsure of where the mask ends and where we as people begin. It causes us to believe that our unique and fundamental uh, modalities of, of being are wrong and that we'll never be accepted as we truly are. Masking can be a trauma response, but it causes more trauma. Uh, research on autistic masking and its link to suicidality is few and far between. Again, something that is egregious. Um, there is some out there. So this is an excerpt from a study called Risk Markers um, for Suicidality in Autistic Adults, which, quote, camouflaging significantly predicted suicidality in the ASC uh, group. In, in this case, ASC is used as an initialism for autism spectrum condition, which is an, another discussion entirely. Um, after controlling for age, sex, presence of at least one developmental condition, depression, anxiety, employment, and satisfaction of living arrangements, camouflaging and age of ASC diagnosis, um, and suicidality and age of ASC diagnosis were not significantly correlated. This suggests that camouflaging is directly associated with suicidality uh, rather than in combination with a delay in ASC diagnosis. Uh, camouflaging also explains significant additional variance in suicidality above depression and anxiety, um, suggesting the association with suicidality is at least in part independent of other mental health. This is the first evidence of camouflaging being a unique independent risk factor for suicidality in ASC. Um, and then there are other problems with ABA that don't have, you know, research backing them up, which I want to touch on, on briefly. Um, the first one is that another less spoken of problem with ABA is that the term is kind of nebulous now. Many places that offer quote unquote ABA therapy actually offer occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, floor time and others, but bill it as ABA because ABA is often the only therapy covered by insurance, at least in the United States, where I live. Um, which leads to generalized confusion about what ABA actually is. Um, and it contributes to a culture of parents who think they have their children in ABA and attacking what self-advocates who have been through ABA have to say about their experiences. Sorry, I'm making notes for us to discuss afterwards. <laughs> oh, no worries, that's, that's amazing. Um, another problem with ABA is that who decides what behaviors are worth extinguishing and, and why? ABA tells us that the way we're allowed to move and communicate is, is predicated on what neuromajorities think about that. Um, but realistically, this is only because there's more of them. If autistics were the majority, neurotypical behaviors might be considered worth extinguishing. And I feel like this is a, a problem that is not touched on ever. I mean, because there are, are more issues than just, you know, 
people's linguistic choices, but the fact of the matter that it's called therapy is wild to me. Our conceptualization of therapy is something that's voluntary. People think I need to go to therapy, whether it is for you know mental therapy or physical therapy, you tore a ligament or or you know broke a bone and need to rehab that. Therapy is voluntary. No child decides to be put through the existential torture that's ABA. And also, 30 to 40 hours a, a week is, um, can you go to the next slide, Chloe? Sorry, yeah. Oh, no worries. Is 30 to 40 hours a week is the, the recommended amount of ABA for a four-year-old. That's a full-time job, man. Like, what? And not only is it developmentally inappropriate, it's like, it's just exhausting. Like, therapy is not a non-activity, especially ABA therapy. Um, and again, my, my slides for other problems with ABA just keep going. <laughs> um, gay conversion therapy is illegal in most of the developed world. Um, at most of, and yet, despite Lovas developing or having a hand in developing what we consider gay conversion therapy, and the original participant of gay conversion therapy, who was forced to endure it, uh, resorting to suicide at age 38, we laud ABA, even though it uses the same principles as gay conversion therapy. Um, and this is because we, we now, at least now, we view therapy as an intrinsic part of who someone is. It's immutable. Um, and autism is still viewed as something to be extinguished. What we need to do is make the societal shift to autism acceptance and, you know, dare I say, autism appreciation um, in a similar way to how we now accept sexualities as an immutable part of who someone is. Um, and this, this, is, this is one argument that needs specific addressing. Um, because I see it more often than not when I speak on my own traumatic experiences with applied behavior analysis, which I, I've spoken with Chloe about before, and I think we can probably add, add the link at some point. Um, but you just got a bad therapist. I see this on other people's experiences as, as well. Like not only is it an example of the widespread societal gaslighting of autistic people, it's logically fallacious. But for, for the sake of argument, uh, let's follow that line of reasoning. Let's say that all these traumatic experiences that research backs up, as I've just shown, um, are just isolated incidents. Let's pretend uh, like that that's a thing. There are hundreds of thousands of autistics speaking out about their ABA trauma. That means hundreds of thousands of autistics have been traumatized by just one bad therapist. They've had just one bad experience. Um, just one supposedly bad or mistrained ABA therapist. What does that say then about ABA therapy as a whole, that this many, that, that there are this many supposedly being mistrained and subsequently traumatizing their clients? Um, what does it say about their ethics, their standards of training or implementation or, or what the field itself does to therapists that do traumatize their clients? As for it not being like that anymore, because I get that a lot too. I get, well, that was the ABA of the 80s and the 90s. Um, I'd have attendees know that I'm sure a lot of at least the autistic advocates that are attending this are aware of the JRC controversy. Um, that it was legal to use electric shock on autists at certain schools until March of 2020. And Applied Behavior Analysis International, which is the organization that um, does a lot of the accreditation for colleges that have APA master's programs, never disavowed any of the aversives um, and the ruling that electric shock aversive use in ABA should be illegal, which the UN considers this a human rights violation, um, was recently overturned and these specific schools will be speak, spoke again at ABA I, um, their national conference about how it should be allowed. Um, which should be allowed, ABA or the, sh the electric shock? Both, both, both. Use of electric shock aversive in ABA. So moving on from qualms of ABA, uh, does therapy, does someone need therapy just because they're autistic? 
the short answer is no, but it's, it is a lot more complicated than that. Um, so to, to go over the short answer, nobody needs therapies just because they are autistic. Autism is a normal and naturally occurring neurotype and there's nothing inherently wrong with being autistic. Often therapies marketed towards parents of autistic youth are made to normalize them, which further harms them. ABA is one of those therapies. The long answer is sometimes. Sometimes autistic people, especially autistic youth, struggle in a world that isn't built for them and refuses to accommodate us. Um, and the fact of the matter is that the way society is currently structured doesn't produce untraumatized autistics. Um, sometimes therapy can help with these struggles depending on what they are. Um, and let's look at you know the social and the medical model of disability to, to think about this further. So this graphic shows the medical model of disability. In short, it, it posits that the difficulties that come along with being disabled are located within the disabled person themselves. The disabled person is the problem in the medical model of disability. Um, this second graphic here um, shows the social model of disability. Um, and again, in short, the social model of disability posits that disabled can actually be a verb, that often the barriers uh, we call disability, including autism, are placed there by society. Um, I, as a disabled person, am actively disabled by society's barriers to access. Um, sometimes, though, autistic people, just like non-autistic people, like allistics, um, struggle. Often these struggles are rooted not in the autists themselves, but in a society that refuses to accommodate autistic neurology. Uh, and this is what we would call the social model of disability. To use another analogy, um, a wheelchair user is not disabled by their wheelchair. Their wheelchair is their, their freedom. Uh, the wheelchair user is disabled by a society that doesn't accommodate people who roll instead of walk. Um, restaurants don't have tables that accommodate wheelchair height. Uh, apartment complexes don't have ramps or elevators when a wheelchair can, where a wheelchair could fit. And when they do, they're often too steep to be safe. Uh, sidewalks don't have cuts in them for the wheelchair user to use. In the same vein, society is so focused on making autistic individuals look and act like neurotypical individuals that they don't accommodate our differences. And when we struggle, it's often because of this. It's not the only reason we struggle, but it's, it's one of them. So for example, grocery stores are a sensory nightmare for me. Like I would rather throw myself head first down a flight of stairs than, than go to the grocery store. Um, the lights are like high beams being pointed directly into my eyes. I'm just bombarded from every angle with this visual clutter and just an insane amount of choices. Uh, there's music in the background and overlapping conversation that my brain can't filter out and it drives me bonkers. My local grocery store doesn't have a sensory friendly shopping time. And those that do often have it for one hour a week, which is usually, you know, times when people work. The ones I've seen are like during the, the day. Um, that's ostracizing. Imagine if neurotypicals could only go grocery shopping for one hour a week on one day. Um, so when I go to the grocery store, which I try not to do, um, I have to load myself up with adaptive technology like noise canceling headphones, sunglasses, and um, sensory accommodating clothes. Like I wear like two XL hoodies and I flap anxiously the whole time and I chew my stim toy necklace and I mean, it's also ostracizing. I would love to not have to do that and then get weird looks from people who were like, whoa. So deciding on therapies. Deciding on therapies is gonna hinge on identifying needs. When you're identifying needs of, of your autistic kiddo, don't, don't project, please. What do you mean, you ask? Um, well, if your child's not speaking like I was until I was 12 years old, I often see parents saying things like, my child is nonverbal, so they need to learn how to talk, which is objectively false. Your child doesn't need to know how to talk. Your child needs to communicate. And there are lots of great ways to communicate that don't involve utilizing verbal vocal speech. Ask yourself what your child struggles with. 
Um, oh no. <laughs> Ask yourself what your child struggles with. And I lost my train of thought for a second. And I do that all the time. If, if, and the brain train doesn't stop at every station either. <laughs> Uh, if this is a problem that your child has, or if it's a problem with society in general. Um, some common examples of autistic struggles are, you know, making verbal vocal speech, or as I like to call them, mouth words. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, I was nonverbal until I was 12. Uh, even so, nonverbal is a misnomer. Um, because even when I was nonverbal, I was particularly verbose. Um, poetry was my special interest. I was hyperlexic and reading at a college level around age eight. Um, language is cognitive. Speech is a motor function. Um, many, if not most folks who are non-speaking know how, under, understand language. Um, they don't have, it's not that they don't have an understanding of language. And the trouble in making mouth words is not rooted in not understanding that, it's, it's rather it's a struggle to move their body intentionally in the minute and specific ways that are required to produce verbal vocal speech. Which brings me to my next common struggle, moving our bodies effectively. Um, this is often referred to apraxia or dyspraxia, which like should be my legal middle name. Um, dyspraxia is a component of autistic neurology and is just a fancy word for our perpetual clumsiness. <laughs> um, Motor planning is hard for us, right? Um, and so purposeful movements that require accuracy can be really difficult. As a child in ABA, I was often framed as being difficult, obstinate, or non-compliant, when in reality, I struggled to move my body the ways I was being told on cue. Um, seeing things like, you know, touch blue over and over and over, touch your nose, like, I, I know where my nose is. I know what blue is. I can't get my body to do that right now. I need extra time to, to figure out how to engineer that movement. Um, this is one of the fundamental problems of ABA, right? It frames everything as a behavior without even looking into the underlying causes. Um, there are real neurobiological differences between autists and, and neurotypicals. Um, had ABA taken into account this dyspraxia, I may have been punished less. Uh, for me, my dyspraxia manifests as poor spatial awareness, bumping into things and people, tripping over my own feet. Um, and sensory, sensory integration is something a lot of autis autistics struggle with. I personally have a lot of sensory processing struggles. Um, I remember mentioning the grocery store earlier. Um, also, socializing is, is another autistic-specific struggle that your child may face. Um, but this one is much more related to society's general intolerance of autistic individuals rather than autistic individuals themselves. Have you heard of the double empathy problem? Um, so this was a problem proposed by academic and father, Dr. Damien Milton. Um, and it basically states that the disconnect between autist, autistics and neurotypicals is not inherent deficits in autistics, but rather that autistics and neurotypicals experience the world differently from each other and therefore have trouble relating to each other. Our last Sorry. slide. Hmm? Where's it gone? Sorry, I got lost with the slide. It's, it's, hold on. It's this one. And that's, that's no worries. Um, and I would, I would, I would um, suggest that everybody look into Milton's double empathy problem. It is, it's phenomenal. Um, we have one next week if he doesn't forget. If he does which it, it, the executive dysfunction makes it makes it a possibility. So um, finding therapies and therapists that orient themselves towards a neurodiversity paradigm may be difficult, but it's, it's going to be worth it. And um, my time here is somewhat limited. I would love to info dump at you for three more hours, uh, but, I, but I can't. Um, so I can't outline everything involved in adopting a neurodiversity paradigm or looking for therapists involved in a neurodiversity paradigm. But for starters, a neurodiversity oriented therapist looks like a person or organization who uh, looks towards autistic adults for guidance, acknowledges the validity of the neurodiversity civil rights movement, 
doesn't use pathologizing language like deficits, disorder, recovery from autism, symptoms, and so on. Um, doesn't withhold loved items or activities for compliance, acknowledges behavior as a form of communication or information transfer, doesn't suppress stims and respects and accommodates sensory differences. Any therapy that is healthy and not detrimental to autistic youth uh, will have a neurodiversity paradigm orientation without emphasis on masking um, or making sure that us endure the trauma of being exposed to sensory stimuli we're averse to. Um, the Therapist Neurodiversity Collective is a great example of therapists with an orientation towards neurodiversity uh, civil rights movement. Uh, to the right is one of their infographics on how to be an ableist therapist, or rather how, or what, what not to do. Um, it's a little hard to read here, so I will summarize. And an ableist therapist will promote autism speaks use puzzle pieces to represent autism in their advertisements or advocacy work, uh, use functioning labels, use person-first language, train social skills, uh, and teach autistic people to mask, deem it as a successful therapy outcome when they comply, um, advertise as an autism trainer or interventionist, uh, promise relief from the suffering of autism with their therapy app, program materials, what have you, uh, promise to reduce autism symptoms, um, and talk about cure with fam so families will buy your product. Collaborate with BCBAs to implement ABA goals. Uh, practice ABA themselves. An ableist therapist will co-author books, therapy materials, or programs with BCBAs, and then advertise therapists as a pro-neurodiversity therapist. Um, or will violate bodily autonomy by using hand over hand with clients without asking for their consent or withhold children or the elderly's access to emotional comfort, food, drinks, favorite items, activities, and personal belongings to gain compliance. And um, I guess that's it. Thank you for listening to me info dump for an hour. <laughs> uh, my go-to word is always fantastic. It's, it is fantastic for the delivery, but obviously the content is quite hard going. Um, but thank you so much. I'm sure that would be so useful so, for so many people and the people are having conversations um, and chatting in the chat box as normal, um, like, like we usually do. Um, I mean, I just made some notes as we were going along. I couldn't access my one note at the same time. So I just had to get pencil and paper. Oh, no. like, <laughs> scribble down quickly. There's been some really interesting conversations in here as well, which um, I don't necessarily think we have to go into, but somebody just asking the question about you know are we as autistic people would we be classed as disabled and what that might mean and so that was quite an interesting discussion i could see going on because obviously you had the example of the medical model versus the social model um and i think to answer sort of some of that question is that by law under you know in the uk i am classed as disabled because i have a diagnosis of autism um in lots of instances, I am disabled by my environment, but I am not inherently disabled by being autistic. So being born autistic is not an inherent disability, disability um, which I know is quite difficult for some people, I guess, to kind of um, understand that concept. Because right. um, like you said, like some people will see somebody in a wheelchair and think, oh, they're disabled. Right. But like you said, actually for so many people that wheelchair is freeing, like you said, it's so important for them. And I actually watched a video the other day um, of um, a wheelchair user who was, their, their chair had been broken on a plane and they were distraught because that is their, that is their, an extension of their body. Right. And it's really heartbreaking. Um, but people don't think about that. They don't think about how important those things are and, and how, that person isn't disabled because it's they have a Because like, again, like it's, it's, I, I find the, the abled community, like people who are not disabled. And I, I do, I do consider myself disabled in the U S autism is also classified as a disability. And that's also part of how autistic people get services is because it's classified as a disability. If it wasn't how yeah. like, we wouldn't have, you know, that sort of access to, you know, whether it's, IEPs or like 503, 504 plans um, or, or other services like BCAs or, um, where was I going with that? 
um, that d disability isn't isn't a dirty word. Like disability yeah. is just part of the human experience. Like since the beginning of time, people have been you know fixing broken bones or taking care of. Like that's part of being a person in a society. Like why would we have a society where we exist with other people if we're not going to help the people, other people? Like. And that is really, really key as well for a lot of people that like exactly being disabled or classing yourself as disabled is not a bad, it's not a bad word or anything like that. And um, I mean, I very much agree with some of what um, Cy, so our lovely Northern Authority was saying that he does feel, um, let me just find it, sorry. Um, he doesn't believe anyone in, is inherently disabled, right. which absolutely I agree. So if a society accommodated all difference, physical and psychological disabilities wouldn't exist. If everyone was blind, then society would be built around the blind and those that could see would be those who would be classed as disabled. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, because we can't sadly live in a utopia, I still dream about utopia, that's mm -hmm. a different thing. But, yeah. yeah, you know, utopia, the autistic planet. Um, but I think, we can certainly get to a point where those who are incredibly disabled by our society can be much less so because some people will argue well what about those autistic people who never develop a mode of communication or one i would think have you really really tried hard enough right. to find one but let's go with the devil devil's advocate you know what about those autistic people who never develop a mode of communication can never live independently etc 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 but actually, nobody lives independently. I know. A single my... person lives independently. Like, if you don't grow your own food and materials to sew your own clothes, if you don't cobble your own shoes, like, there is no such thing as independence in this society. That is oh, yeah. a beautiful oh, thing. Example. All the time. I say, if you're not, unless you're living in the woods, making your own things, etc., we're all dependent on another human being to some extent. I guess where I was going with that, if I remember my train of thought as well, is that we can certainly, for those individuals who people will be like, but they're incredibly disabled, we can absolutely make the world less disabling. They might always be disabled, but we can certainly reduce the severity of the societal disability, not the severity of their autism in quotation marks. Yes. Right. And it's like there's because that's that's also another logical fallacy a lot of people employ in the like discussions of the like autism community rather than the autistic community is like, well, what if they're never not disabled? Like, oh, because there's not a perfect solution, we can't help. Yeah. We can't like, oh, okay, that's a great way of, but we're the ones with black and white thinking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you've already said it as well and it kind of um, because fantastic um, person in our comment section I love it because while we've been chatting other people here are also trying to educate and help somebody else who was asking questions about disability I do I love this love this um, community it's really great um, I'm just trying to try and find it so what they were trying to ask you know so are we inherently disabled or are we disabled etc so people were trying to help answer that question um, but they came back to so they're asking the question, so by accessing the word disabled, would you say that it is or can be advantageous in assisting autistics in being understood better? Now that all depends on who's you're talking to, who's yeah. receiving it, the information, but absolutely we don't have an issue with the word disabled and it, ideally, it would be a way of communicating the environment needs to change in you right. or the environment needs to do something and like um, even even beyond that like having words to describe our experiences is so incredibly important like whether that that word is autism or disabled or whatever like knowing that there's a community of, of people who feel the same way you do or have the same traits as you do and you're not just this you know alien creature wandering the planet that you're like a broken neurotypical you're a perfectly normal autistic individual or a perfectly normal disabled individual having words to frame our experiences makes us feel less alone it allows us to access community and that's and i think because you said about because i write quite a lot at the moment about the importance of autistic identity culture community and space so people who are used to me or will hear me saying it all, in exactly that yeah. order all the time um and you mentioned about the you know you are really interested in talking about um autistic culture um, and community where was i going with this hold on oh so you can certainly tell 
where the what narrative somebody is coming from so for instance um i've definitely delivered training and was discussing language and there was a disabled person in attendance as in they had a physical disability um and that you know was impacting their um quality of life um but for them, they clearly came from the medical model. And so they didn't like to be classed as disabled. They didn't like to be called a disabled person. So you can certainly see where that narrative really does impact the individual. So if we now talk about what we would always talk about, which is why we're an autistic person, not a person with autism, right? Because we're not embedded in the medical narrative about ourselves. So we are not people with this thing called autism spectrum disorder attached to us. We are societally disabled autistic people. Um, hopefully that makes sense to. to right. Oh, I have, I have like, like paragraph upon paragraph on the page about, about this. And I, I feel like most, most advocates will, because it seems like a harmless linguistic choice, but it's it's not it leads to if you think that our autism like if you, if you think our personhood is separate from our neurology it leads to you know like cure b culture that like you need to cure your autism or even that you can cure autism um it leads to like like the the bleach cult like let's give our kid bleach to very dangerous discussions it. yeah it, yeah it's it's a very very dangerous place to start when you think you can separate our, our, our personhood from our neurology. And the fact of the matter is we use person first language or um, identity first language every day. Are you a mother or are you a person with children? Are you a, a waitress or a person with a restaurant? Are you tall or are you a person with height? Are you a dog lover? Or are you a person who, lo like nobody bats an eye when I say I'm a tall person um, nobody's like, you're putting your height before your humanity or like, I'm a tired person. They're like, no, 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 don't put your energy levels before your personhood. It's only when we're viewing it in the context of autism that it becomes a bad thing to say that you're an autistic person instead of a, a tired person. Or like when I say that I'm a CrossFit athlete, they don't go, no, you're not. You're a person who attends CrossFit. Like it's, it's really the word autism that's the hang up here. And that's, and that's why, like I say, mostly what I'm interested in and what I'm writing about, the research that I want to do is how psychologically beneficial it is to be an autistic person yes. immersed in autistic culture and connecting to the community. It really does have psychological well-being properties for us because you're not isolated and you're connecting in a balanced way. You're not connecting based on deficit. There's something wrong with me. Yes. And, and also not the opposite, which is we're superhuman Super <laughs> because neither of those both of those are the list yeah neither of those narratives are representative or realistic of autistic experience um mary i'm just going to quickly answer that one so the question is what's your views on cbt can it be helpful or more damaging it's really really dependent on multiple things so one of the key things I do, I mean, you could literally get this video of mine for a pound if you wanted to just make a donation of a pound. I, I obviously I would recommend it because I made it, but I go through, instead of thinking so much about specific therapies like CBT, it's, I try to teach what kind of autistic person are you? Because um, lovely Sam Harris asked, um, so actually if, if Sai's still around, could you actually link the video I did with Sam Harris, which is on the YouTube, where I talk about this. So when somebody will say, well, what's a really good therapy for the well-being? So we're not now talking about interventions. We're not, we're moving away from the ABA stuff. We're talking about how do we improve our well-being when we feel right. sad, when we feel really anxious, you know, what do we, where do we go? Um, so Sam did the thing of, so what's, what's a really good therapy for autistic people? And it's like, well, what's a really good therapy for non-autistic well, people? Anyone, yeah. Right. That's a really it, good therapy. It depends on the person. It depends. So what I talk about in my autistic well-being, what works video is you need to learn your own or your loved one or whoever's autistic profile. So do they think in pictures or not? That really impacts whether they can do certain things in therapies like imagination techniques will not work with somebody who is aphantasic and can't. That's think me. Pictures. Like, I didn't know people. Like, I know that people think like autistic people think in pictures. Thanks, Temple Grandin. 
um, what in my head, I see words like coming up on a typewriter. I don't, pictures are not there unless I like smoke a shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. but you're, but you're, this, I think what's, what's always really interesting and beautiful about the autistic community is we are extremes, our spiky profiles, right? So I'm hyper fantastic. I really constantly think in pictures. I think and that's that, overwhelming. It's exhausting, right? And that means it impacts me in certain ways. For instance, um, if you think about, if you've, if you've ever experienced a traumatic experience mm. and you can feel like you're reliving it like a movie, like yeah. how traumatic therapy could be if it focuses on imagination techniques and so on. How do you then work with somebody like yourself who doesn't think in pictures, but there's imagination techniques. So CBT can use quite a lot of imagination techniques. So actually those things are really important to work out. And that's why I go over all the different things that might be useful. I do talk about CBT and the evidence, which is very limited. There's very few papers on whether CBT and adapted CBT works for autistic people. And it's very similar to what you discussed, JJ, with the ABA is that the majority of the research, which like I say, is actually very limited in relation to CBT, doesn't ask the autistic people if the therapy worked. It asks the therapists, for instance, if they think they did a good job, right? So it's very bizarre. There's not enough longitudinal research, all that kind of stuff. So that's that's a whole other talk. And like part of part of my problem with CBT is like, and I don't I don't necessarily have a problem with CBT as a whole, but when I tried it, it was very much like well, let's reframe the way we're thinking about this. And it's hard for me to, again, put the locus of the disability on on myself. Like, I don't want to reframe the way I think about my own oppression. Yeah. Like, and this the is fact something... of the matter is autistics are a marginalized mi minority and, and, and ignoring that fact denies the nuance of experience and uh, stereotypes us to this like psychiatric yeah and that's a whole other i've got a, I mean, really is, i'm sorry the training that i started doing in from 2012 onwards before really getting stuck into the autistic stuff if you like that of delivering training and things was on the reduction of mental health stigma by discussing it in terms of neurodivergence because to me we, you really don't have disordered people but we do live in a disordered society yes. and it makes much more sense to fix the disordered society poverty racism oppression etc etc it makes sense to tackle those disordered things in society than keep putting band-aids onto the poor people right. that are suffering and then putting them back into you know the pits kind so of thing of like mental illness anyways like all the co-occurring psychological stuff going on seems like a profoundly human response to just shitty inescapable situations like of course i'm going to be depressed but very reasonable responses to a disordered society. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and like you said, I mean, again, I'm just stepping on my own video, but <laughs> you know, our anxiety levels are probably always going to be higher mm -hmm. as autistic people because we are constantly bombarded by things that make us anxious. Um, so you can certainly get to a, a point where you recognize your baseline and then if it's, you know, gone too high or gone too low, you know, not too low, gone too high, then you can reduce it back to your baseline with support. Um, but anxiety, like I say, I talk about in the, that particular video, um, doesn't really get impacted by CBT. Depression can, um, but then I also talk about, is it depression or burnout? So yeah, that's a whole other sure. talk. So let's go, I wanna go, cause I have got some notes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so so this was just because, I, I know, it's just too interesting. Um, and then, so this is just because as you were talking, and I can't think what it relates to now, but I just made the note, um, is that particularly obviously in relation to ABA, because you, you talked about the evidence that it creates or is more likely to create post-traumatic stress responses for autistic people. So it made me think about when we had Nick Walker on and we're having her on again soon, which I'm very excited about. I just, I, like, I love her from afar. I, I'm like too scared to even be like, Nick, I love you. She's so lovely. It's just really, really lovely. Really Nick, we should be friends. Yes, <laughs> I think. Be friends, it's fantastic. But you know, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, because um, I like a good meme, is I quoted her by saying that you can't unqueer queer so you can't unqueer neuroqueer people so if we're born autistic you are born neuroqueer you have a different neurology a different body mind as nick says so when you then use aba to try and unqueer an autistic mind 
all you do is make it multiply queer. Multiply yeah. queer, yes. It will end up with post-traumatic stress, anxiety. It, I mean, the brain, but the person will end up with also other forms of neurodivergence. Absolutely. Like I have, like ABA, ABA stole, stole, stole my childhood, and the resulting CPTSD stole my adulthood. I am terrified of everything. I have flashbacks all the time to ABA, the way it made me feel, the, 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 the changes I think about, like fundamentally the way it changed itself. And one thing I didn't even talk about in my presentation is, you know, the prevalence of, of eating disorders um, that ABA causes because it's like, here's, you get this quarter of a cookie for touch blue, touch nose, touch blue again, let me hug you without you screaming. Um, and I, to this day, and I, I know personal anecdotes are not science, how many personal anecdotes about ABA doing you until it becomes science. Um, I've gone to therapy in the past to try to help what I consider disordered eating. However, therapists, traditional therapists don't know how to help me because my view of I'm hungry, which I have little to no interoception, so I don't get hunger cues anyways. Um, my hunger, hunger is tied to my productivity. So when I don't view myself as productive enough to have deserved this food, therapists who specialize in eating disorders, they're like, we don't, we don't know how to fix that. But when that's the motivation, when that's ABA, like, oh, you can't have waffles outside of ABA, it, it becomes a reward. It, it, it's, it's altering your neurochemistry. It's, it's just like, I'm 31 years old. The fact that like, I even think like this is mildly embarrassing to me. Like it didn't, I didn't have to be this way. And, and paired with the, the lack of interoception is it's, it's, you know, you're just doubly fucked. I mean that, that particular, um, I, I only memed it the other day, but um, because that's one of the key things that I want people to try and understand about themselves. So the meme that I shared the other day or infographic, it's actually an infographic. I get confused between the difference between meme and infographic. I feel like an infographic can become a meme. Yes, mine is definitely an infographic and not a meme. Um, and that one's been shared quite a lot. And it's basically explaining that if you experience elixithymia, so that difficulty regulating or recognizing emotions in yourself, remembering I'm not educating necessarily you, JJ. Um, so people, you know, who autistic people experience elixithymia, which is relatively common in our community, are then more likely to experience interoception uh, differences or difficulties. So knowing your own inside working of your body, um, and then you're more likely to also be an afan and not think in pictures. These are very, co so those are the key things I typically want to know about the autistic person in front of me to know, right, how am I gonna, how do I need to adapt my communication? Because that person can't understand um, uh, analogies and things like this. I made the mistake of saying to one of my students who I support, who's fantastic, who's elixithymic, terraception difficulties and, um, Affant doesn't doesn't think in pictures and said, um, you know, oh, I can imagine that would have been the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And, and she just looked at me so confused, like bewildered, like I have no idea what that means because she can't see it. Right. So those things are, the, are really important. So, yeah. So if, if you're an Affant, largely JJ, and then you've got interoception yes. uh, issues, I'm assuming that you are relatively elixithymic. So struggling yeah, like trouble identifying emotions as I'm feeling them. Very, very yeah. much, so. and like I can look back and be like, "Oh, that was that was angry," which yeah. I feel like leads to a lot of like the I'm not a naive person. I can intellectualize until I'm blue in the face, but I feel like a lot of the time it leads to either me being taken advantage of by like supposed friends or whatever, and I leave interactions and I'm like, "Oh, yay! Like someone's actually talking to me!" Like because I am the the jerk who starts sentences with. There were 77 ways to spell right in Middle English. Did you know that? And then like, and like That's fantastic. why doesn't anybody want to talk to me? Um, so when I do, we do. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, oh, someone's talking to me. This is great. I love that I'm like making friends. And then I leave the interaction and I'm like, oh, wait, wait, that was condescending. And I'm actually feeling a little bit angry about that. <laughs> um, so it leads to very, we do actually have an uh, um so tigger and um, david uh, they started up an especially interesting podcast so for those autistic exactly so for those autistic people <laughs> who have something or some things that they can info dump for about 45 minutes oh you have um, no idea 
<laughs> so yes, yeah, so we've got, I think that's become relatively popular because one, you don't have to be on camera obviously because it's audio. Yeah. So this is a little bit of a less scary setting and it doesn't have to be about autism. You know, so our, our education here is all about autistic stuff. But the especially interesting podcast is you're autistic and you have something to tell us, something interesting. Um, so, so far they've done Lord of the Rings and Tarantulas. I didn't listen to the Tarantulas one. Um, um, but there's there's going to be so many. I think it's one about yo-yos, you know. So if anyone's got an interesting, I don't know where we've gone, how we ended up here. Um, <clears throat> Interoception is, is where we started. Okay. Uh, well, we talked about, okay, so you can't unqueer neuroqueer, right? So trying to change autistic people to be not autistic will just make us multiply um, neurodivergent and neuroqueer. Um, what did I say? I, I, this is the thing which I think is quite clear and obvious to most people, but there is obviously a difference across society. So why is ABA, so coming back to the slides, why is ABA so big in the US? I mean, it is, it is used here, it is pushed here, they use PBS um, and, and try to maintain that PBS is not ABA or it's a better it form. It's the, same, it's the same thing, just under a different different wrapping. Um, but I, I, I don't feel it's as invasive. It might, it might still be. Somebody is welcome to, to correct me. I don't have children, so um, but I just feel there's a very big difference. Why is that? Because you said it's what you would have to get um, your insurance would be more likely to pay for ABA, right? We don't have that in the UK. It's just really, it's NHS. So everything, you know, our healthcare is free. God, what's so, like? <laughs> well, it could be better if the government, that's a whole other conversation, but it's it better <laughs> if the government put all, you know, the decent resources and money into the NHS. But, you know, compared to countries where, um, you know, healthcare is not free, then it's great. I, I think, I think some of it is based in just the pathology paradigm that like this needs to be fixed. I think a lot of it is based in this like late stage capitalism mindset. Well, how can we make these people more productive and lucrative members of society? Um, and like, I mean, but like, I feel like most countries have pathology paradigms, whether or not they're doing well at breaking out of them. So it, it doesn't really um, tell us why ABA, particularly in the US, like I've um, either mod or take part in a lot of groups that center autistic adults to, um, for neurotypical parents to ask us questions. And I see like, it's not that pervasive in Australia. It's not that pervasive in the US, but it, in, you, you can't even discuss autism um, in the U.S. without bringing ABA into it. It's 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 really it's it's wild, I, and I don't know if it is just we need a paradigm shift or not because it is yeah. so ingrained in everything, and it's scary, right? It terrifies me. Um, I definitely, and and that's something as well. I made a note about which is. I mean, I don't have, I, I really apologize. I don't want to offend you, but I really don't have any desire to be in America. <laughs> You're the you know, so, okay, I didn't want to offend you. And we've got some lovely, um, I mean, to be fair, they don't live in America now, they live here. So that might be saying something sure. as well. Um, but I wouldn't want to be me being autistic in America. It's, um, yeah. And and because you were discussing, you know, about that fear and and so to some extent embarrassment of being openly autistic in, in right. public and things and that's a really that that's that always makes me sad that it's it's why like i i will very much like and it's 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 incredible um because i'm i'm very open about my autism and, and for me that's part of my unmasking and unpacking my own like internalized ableism and and you know escaping pathology paradigms which is going to be a, a lifelong improvement um, because nobody's perfect but for me fully being upfront about my autism and open about it has been key to unmasking and people cannot conceptualize that I can be proud of of my existence as an autistic individual um, can't conceptualize why I would be so open about it I was at the donut shop up the road the other day um and the person i was i was with um i took a friend who was like, you need to eat these donuts because they did need to eat those donuts and i said something about 
um, a particular pastry they had there. And I was just, you know, my autism brain loves the texture. I, I love like pie and pastry, but I find that the, the texture, the flakiness can be overwhelming to me. And this is perfect. And as I'm walking out the door, the person I was with was like, um, what, like, why do you need to tell everybody about being autistic? Like, I just wouldn't. And I was like, well, because uh, people need to know that it's not a shameful existence. People need to know like, like that you can be an autistic adult and be happy and joyful. Like people need to know that autism isn't specific to boys or children. And if I'm not open and proud about my autism in the way it impacts me both negatively and positively, because I've never met a neurotypical that gets the sensory joy out of mint chocolate chip ice cream that I do. Um, I've never met a neurotypical who can look into the center of a marble for a half hour like I do. The fact that I'm able to find beauty and stimulation in these just minute everyday things is incredible to me. I love my brain even when I struggle and that like people need to know that there's more to autism than tragedy. And if I don't do that, like who, who else is going to, of course, there's a lot of adults out there that are talking about the, the joy of, of autistic experience, but like, I don't know any in person. So I'm going to be that person. Like how, how can you, you know, these people run around saying the quotes, Oh, be the change you wish to see in the world. But as soon as I mention autism, they're like, Oh no, not, not like that. that. Not that <laughs> and I think that some people do might struggle with that it took me a long time to get to a point where i could say i like myself yes. and there's a lot of and that i don't i think there's probably lots of human beings of any neurology who actually really struggle to get to that point and actually like themselves i'm not saying that there's not things i wouldn't change or that i can keep i want to keep growing i want to keep right. improving all that kind of thing but inherently i know i'm trying my best i'm trying to yes. do the best i can as as who i am at this point in time and i like me and i think that can be confusing to people because then they think well you can't be in quotation marks that autistic etc and it's like um and, and trigger warning i'm only mentioning suicide i'm not going to go into details you know i could explain to people but it did take me time to get to this point I have been suicidal. I have, you know, in my earlier years and things like this. And I think that's really important to show that balance as well and say, look, this is what I struggle with. But ultimately, I really don't want to be somebody else. I actually like me. Right. And, and neuro neurotypicals project their own black and white thinking on onto artists because like they're like, oh, well, you must not struggle like that if you if you like yourself. Motherfucker, I am hot shit, man. It doesn't mean I don't struggle. Like, two things can be true at the same time. I struggle immensely every day. That doesn't mean I hate myself over it. You have to, like, one thing that got to me to start being compassionate towards myself was, I mean, A, escaping pathology paradigms. I grew up with, you know, the quintessential martyr mommy, um, autism warrior mommy. Obviously, she would be an ABA. Um, but also like the way I beat myself up in my head, not only just for my autistic traits, but like everything is, would I speak to a student like this? Would I speak to friends like this? Absolutely yeah. not. So why should I speak to myself like this? <laughs> exactly. And I think that's it's a really, simple, but it's not. Yeah. I think that's a really, just, just that is so useful. You know, what are you saying about yourself to yourself? Would you say it to you? I think I saw, um, I, I do a thing I have like part of my routine is I just watch sort of really cute uh, or funny Instagram videos or like TikTok that's been put on Instagram and I just sit and watch that for about half an hour before I decide to go to bed um, and then I read etc etc what's my point my point was oh yeah so I saw a lovely video where it was quite heartfelt it was basically yeah taking adults um, and then having them tell their sibling the sorts of things that they say about themselves in their own head. So they didn't bring the sibling in. They didn't know the sibling was going to be there. So they, you know, the the interviewer would say, "How do you think of yourself? How do you talk to yourself in your own head?" How, and it was, you know, really quite hurtful stuff. Then they brought their sibling, their younger sibling, in, who they didn't know there was going to be there. And they said, "I want you to now say the same things to your sibling," and they they didn't want to because it's hurtful. Right. 
and it was beautiful because it was about don't say that stuff to yourself because you and wouldn't it, say it to other people it can be so very hard not to think of yourself and like again this is pathology right? disability, but like when you're harmless autistic traits like walking through the grocery store and flapping my hands because I'm really, really happy that they had my same food. Um, and then like the looks you get is like, so like it's hard not to think of yourself as this broken defective thing. Like I took not just years, decades to get to where I am um, to, to unmask and to be proud of my autistic neurology and to accept myself as a, a disabled individual. And like, I, I was like your kid, man. And in a lot of cases, I still am. Um, the fact of the matter is you don't, you, your 15 minutes of conversation with me in the grocery store, your small talk, doesn't show you any of my struggles, any. And, you know, to an extent that's always by design. Like on my page, I talk a lot about the things I struggle with, especially socially. Um, but in my interpersonal life, and I don't know if that's internalized ableism or, you know, knowing that a lot of the neurotypicals I've known want to have one up on you and want to have, well, I can, you know, put this in my back pocket and kind of use it um, as an advantage for later is I don't try to not talk about my struggles, but I don't necessarily highlight them. And I don't think that autistic people need to be outlining our every struggle to neuro neuro majorities in order to have our autism validated by them does that does that make sense the way i'm saying that like yeah, yeah. to prove to you that i'm autistic i don't i don't need to show you that i schedule 45 minutes before every social interaction so i can like be in the parking lot and puke and quell my panic attack you don't need to know that you don't like i don't ask you such things and the fact that I, you I, to like hurt your chest and bleed all over the floor for them on their command is wild to me and I had a really difficult time the other day because I've been attending different meetings and in one of the meetings that there are other autistic people there, but it is a mixed neurology meeting. And I've been trying to explain for such a long time that 9 a.m. is really disabling to me. Mm -hmm. Like 9 a.m. in the morning is disabling. And I hate having to say that because I know that I'm probably going to be judged as lazy, for for instance, that I can't or I don't function well before 11 a.m. in the morning because that sounds lazy. And it's like, well, you don't see me working into the night. What but I didn't. Yes. And, and I could. And so at that point, it takes me too long to get to a point where I can best use mouth words. Um, so I'm not situation in you. Um, I don't experience that, but I do experience, um, you know, like a mechanical issue almost when I'm really burnt out or I'm just not ready to use mouth words. And I'm also being a bit kinder to myself. And even when I know I can push through and use mouth words and telling myself, no, you don't have to save those spoons mm -hmm. for the people that you want to use those mouth words with. But I was, I just got so frustrated and Teams wasn't working. I hate Teams. I was trying to use the chat box and get my point across. It would not send. And I got to the point where I was literally tearful, which doesn't happen very often because my voice was not getting heard. And I was getting so frustrated because the technology wasn't working, the disable, disabling hour of being asked to come at a 9 a.m. meeting, which they know about that. I've already asked, can it not be this early? I'm not the only one who's disabled by 9 a.m. meetings. And I think they're going to look into it. Um, but I didn't feel like I should have to explain why. I just, it frustrated me. So like what you just said, whereas I had meetings later where I explained about the morning being really difficult. And because they were like friends or something, I explained, I don't take my anti-anxiety meds really early. So it takes time for them to kick in mm -hmm. before I can start to be in, an, in a situation that's less anxiety provoking. And like I just explained, it takes me a longer time to the, get psychologically, cognitively ready to use words. I have this routine, which takes me about two hours, even though actually showering, eating and putting makeup on only takes me about half an hour. It's you know, all of these things, but we shouldn't have to explain that stuff to be taken seriously as autistic enough in quote. I don't know where I'm going with this, by the way. It, I'm just it seems like a, like a, like, it seems like a profoundly weird paradox to me that we're simultaneously supposed to perform neurotypicality to be taken seriously and also supposed to perform our autism in order to be taken seriously. I don't know what neurotypicals want from us at, at this point. 
like if I perform neurotypicality, I'm not autistic enough. And if I perform my autism, well, like, oh God, what are you even doing in public? Are you even allowed to be here? Yeah. I do wonder if I were to, I don't, I don't think this is ever going to happen, but if I were to come and like lecture to some, to, to a group, you know, uh, you don't necessarily call them universities, it's college, right? College? Yeah, call it colleges. I mean, the summer universities, but I, I okay. don't know this. Yeah, college and university is very different for us here. So um, I think we've discussed this before. Um, yeah, college is, is sort of what you would do before you go to university. Oh, yeah, like community college or, ju or junior college. Or, or college. Or, I guess, if anyone's American <laughs> and is in the UK and knows the differences, I always get stuck with this. But yeah, so if I were to come as like a, I don't know, um, uh, a guest lecturer to uh, university or college or whatever, however you describe it, you know, how, because I teach, I'm, I am in a privileged position that everybody knows I'm autistic. Um, if they don't, they live under a rock. Um, and I teach with STEM objects. I actually give my students who are all adults STEM objects, which they find really strange at first until they've been with me for a few weeks. You know, I'll put earplugs in, I'll move around, all this kind of thing. And I just think, how how would that go down? Me being that openly autistic whilst giving a lecture? I don't know. It's, it's, it leads to a weird sort of, of line you have, have to walk right because like then at least in my experience like neurotypicals also especially in professional environments where it's like well you kind of become the token artist people want you to educate and talk about your neurology um but they don't want to pay your rates because you're autistic or um you're a great resource and everybody likes you in the professional capacity but then nobody invites you out to lunch or to the party um so you're always kind of on the outskirts of everything until right. you have autism and then you're like okay i was gonna say i kind of always was anyway so i don't think yeah. that makes any difference but My if i could yeah um although i'm thinking i wouldn't necessarily be there to train about autism per se it could be literally anything anything um, i would just be t well i mean i i when i've been teaching it's just psychology broadly um which is obviously very very broad um gone off on a tangent in my head Okay, so that was my point. I think I only got a couple more left. So what would you... Oh, and this was because I know this is one of our lovely American mobmins who is in America with her fantastic um, sons, um, autistic family. Um, and the question was, what, you know, what do you do if you can't unmask? Because it does seem like it is harder to do, particularly in America. I'm not saying it's easy in, in the UK either. I think it really depends where you are on the context so what do we do if we can't unmask i i literally fall apart i would i would be dead i've attempted suicide multiple times like i go into these i personally go into profound states of burnout where i i don't move i don't get out from under my covers i can't take care of my pets or my spouse and i can't do anything because it's so exhausting to keep the mask on in in my case if you keep the mask on you you die you there's not i don't i don't know if for me there's another option but also like especially in the u.s with the amount of like police violence and racism we have like i can't even imagine what it would be to really like a black or a brown artist because like i get accused of being on drugs all the time i was at domino's the other day and like the person pulled the person i was with aside it's like a with some drugs I'm like no they're autistic um but like for black and brown artists there's the intersection of police violence there like and you hear about like it's just i wish i had better advice and i understand that it's a privilege for me to be able to unmask to the extent i do and it doesn't want this I think, I mean, my, I guess my answer or my contribution as an answer to that person's question is what we've tended, Annette and I, for instance, have tended to say to our students that come through our post-diagnostic support program at the university is that even if they can only be as authentically themselves in the two hours that they're with us a week, right. we see an improvement in their well-being. So it's like, it's what Kieran says. So definitely look at, um, so I, I know that person would have seen the stuff with Kieran because they're, they're always with us and they're fantastic. Um, 
you know, the video, the latest video we did with Kieran on what is masking really, because mm. people get it really confused in the literature, they don't understand it um, as a, a trauma response. And, and he says it, he doesn't, he's never actually said that people should unmask per se. He's saying you, but it's important to t take control of the mask. Right. So use it when you need it, like a tool, and then have those places and spaces where you can be your authentic yeah. self. Like, even if it's like, you, you need to find times to be autistic when you can, whether that is privately using like a fidget spinner or like giving yourself permission to go to bed earlier when you're tired or like not speaking when you're at home in, you know, utilizing, you know, low tech AAC or writing notes, like, or, or you know, flapping your hands around when you're happy when nobody else is there. You need to have these glimpses of, of allowing your neurology to present itself because the mask can't be an all the time thing. Like there is no such thing as, as perfect authenticity. I feel like there are times when even then authenticity feels like a performance, at least for me. Um, Am I going with them? Like, I don't think there's such thing as perfect authenticity and, and being as autistic as you are all the time because everybody needs to mold themselves to certain situations. It's the extent that you're doing it. And it, it's when that sort of conformity becomes contortion, recognizing when the mask is hurting you and when it's helping you, um, understanding your own triggers, what makes you want to mask. And is it is it within yourself or is it society's expectations of you are there people you can take aside and be like hey i'm autistic these are some of the sensory needs i'm identified i've identified in myself when i'm with you can i xyz um, and if, if it's not offensive to draw the parallel because you, you i think you did somewhat as well in the talk between for instance masking i don't think you would use that terminology but masking as a queer person right so if somebody's trans or gay or whatever it might be and is that fair to say that there are going to be certain circumstances sadly where there is the need to mask that queerness and then there's going to be safe places to be yourself right is exactly that, that that makes and i mean i think that's it's not just like being analogous with like lgbtqia stuff but like my spouse in particular and i'm going to state this because like not a lot of people are watching the live know them but they're 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 very closeted about their gender and their sexuality and they live their lives as a cis man and they're not and when they're in spaces with certain people they have certain events they go to where they dress up and are able to be authentic and that has been key to them not like fucking dying um because they recognize when they can be and have have come to terms with that and let it out um and recognize when they can't be and need to you know still i'm like this and this is for me and this is my existence but i need to be something else and it's not necessarily pretending once you get to the point of acceptance it's just recognizing when it's safe to be you and when it's not safe to be you and of course the goal is to move towards safety all the time um or at least as much as possible right because my life is never going to be able to take hormones or you know all these things because of their job or whatever but it's it's that there there are parallels between queer masking and autistic masking or any sort of any sort of masking yeah um and i've just tagged um uh, tanya's comment so the concept of unmasking can cause further masking so it's about self-awareness of your needs so this is actually quite interesting tanya so i've been doing some work with i won't name them but another university mm -hmm. and we're creating um sort of neurodiversity friendly discussions basically for the students who are neurodivergent because sadly for some reason at that university they don't seem to implement inclusive learning plans like we do in my university which is basically for us to meet the equality law right right um so what we're doing is we're actually trying to help those um, students self-advocate so i think instead of us thinking about it as unmasking and trying to get to this perfect goal of being authentically autistic because I think those are quite difficult concepts yes, as well. And much, difficult. Especially in countries that are steeped with pathology paradigms or where it may yeah. not be safe to be openly autistic. 
Exactly. So that, those are quite big and it's quite difficult to have those as goals. So what we've been working on, for instance, with this university is we don't talk about that. We don't talk about masking or anything, but we do talk about um, self-advocacy skills. So if you're an autistic person and you don't necessarily understand yet because of masking, for instance, um, your needs, you don't recognise when you should be doing a certain thing like moving and stimming because you're actually you're getting overwhelmed, etc. So part of self-advocacy, there's a number of um, stages. It was like self-awareness. So learning about yourself and your needs. Um, it was recognizing the law, what's, what law is on your side as well. And then learning how to communicate that right. about your needs, right? So that's all about, you know, setting boundaries with people, telling people, right, Instead of going up to somebody and saying, which is something else we're teaching them, instead of going up to somebody and saying, I'm autistic, I need support, nobody knows what to do with that unless right. they're autistic and we would ask more questions because we want you to clarify. But like the you professionals know. in these cases, especially in like university settings and like the disability centers, don't know what questions to ask in order to further help. Exactly, <laughs> right? So it's easier um, and actually more beneficial for you to learn yourself mm -hmm. a bit more. That might mean you have to do that with another autistic person or a group or a therapist who's very understanding and recognizes what autistic experience is but learn yourself learn your needs um, and then you'll be able to communicate those so instead of saying to somebody i'm autistic please help me or i want support or i want accommodations and that person looks blankly you can say you know um just as an example if i meet somebody new and they go to shake hands and i'll go oh um i can't do I'm quite, quite tactile averse, so I, I don't do handshaking, but you can have an awkward way, you know, this kind of thing. So you're conveying your needs, you're setting your boundaries and things like that at that point in time. Does that make sense? And no, and it does. And it's a really interesting, and I, like I hate to go off topic, this is tangentially related, um, but it feels like, and also the, the reactions of the people around you when you say like, hi, I'm, I'm tactile averse, I have these sort of sensory issues and attention differences rather than saying, I'm autistic. The reaction is entirely different when I say I have anxiety struggles, like I have social anxiety, I have sensory issues. Without using the word autism, the the it's it's you know like night and day, um, which is which is wild to me because I'm just communicating the ways my autism impacts me rather than the neurotypicals around me. But as soon as you use the word autism, it's like a switch flips, right? And I think it is because of the narrative, right? people don't really know unless they're obviously people like ourselves or people who just really really make an effort to understand autistic experience they don't know what that means and so you know I've seen sometimes um, you know lecturers or academics and things might say actually it'd be quite useful to know the person's disability i.e are they autistic etc mm -hmm. and one you can't ask for that information if the student doesn't want to give it yeah. and two you wouldn't know what to do with that information anyway Even because if it can slap you in the face. right well like right. Even, even like at least in the u.s like the textbooks people are using like i've had like intro psych students um because i'm because i'm an academic tutor these days and like just the way the textbooks are framing and, and talking about autism and i'm like what? like no wonder you think this about autistic yeah. people like you need to have up-to-date research like this is research from the the, the 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 like the 60s what like and it shouldn't be on like, especially in, in, in the university settings, like when I was in undergrad and stuff and taking, you know, all the, all the intro-psych stuff, um, because that's 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 not my discipline. Um, so I, I'd be sitting there and people would be talking about autism, the professor would be talking about autism, like, I don't want to be the asshole that raises my hand and be like, um, excuse me, professor, what the fuck? Um, but like, I don't think they even sometimes realize that you know statistically you have at least three other autists in your class whether they're diagnosed or not and you are talking about us yeah people think it's this thing that and i think that is really key is that everybody whenever you talk about anyone or a group of people if you would not be willing to say what you're saying in private to that group or that person you really need to second think what you're talking about how you think about those people you know that's probably something you know i would i would say the majority of what i say behind closed doors i will think about would i be willing to say that publicly exactly. then i'm not going to say it i'm not going to think it i'm going to change my attitude it's not good enough you know? 
it's and it's it's and like also I think some of it is like some of the people who say that don't realize that that is incredibly insulting, incredibly ostracizing because that's the way they've always talked about autism. Like you see it in the the person first versus identity first language debate. Like, well, that's how we were taught to speak. So, how dare you, one person, say, you know, otherwise? Like, if I am not autistic enough to talk about the autistic experience. Neither are you. <laughs> um, okay, my last, I think my last point, and then um, I think we'll get to wrapping up at nine o'clock, fantastic. Um, so it was just something that I've been thinking about quite a bit, which is I very, very rarely, unless I'm training, um, use the word autism, because I will talk about autistic experience and things. I don't want to, you know, reify this thing called autism spectrum disorder um, and it's a note that i've made because i think you would think along the same line so obviously correct me if i'm wrong um and i've seen this like somebody was asking me recently and i can't remember why i think it was an interview and they were asking do we need to move away from this and start talking more about um you know stop talking about autism awareness and let's talk, start talking about autism acceptance and then not, not only was that a really behind that's a really we're, we're we're much further than that by let's, now let's get there first yeah we're much further than the, even autism acceptance we want to be getting even further to appreciation you know, exactly appreciation but the point that i made to them is i don't want people to accept autism spectrum disorder i don't want people to embrace this thing called autism this thing called autism spectrum disorder i want people to stop looking at it as this abstract thing and start talking about accepting autistic people. Right. And I think if we get people to start having that shift, it will make it much harder to be cruel to us. Does that make sense? Because no, we're not means, talking about accepting autism spectrum disorder. We're talking about accepting autistic people. Yeah. Because like whether or not, like what the DSM or in your case, the ICD, it is the ICD, yes? In, we do use both to be fair okay. yeah. um says about autism spectrum disorder like we're more than a collection of symptoms like we are humans with individual experiences and you know our our autism shapes those experiences short um heavily and it should be recognized that everything i do and experience i do and experience autistically but also like i have all of these other nuances from the rest of my experiences that impact that and like one of one of so I um in one of the very few social spaces I go to there is a younger autistic person um they are about I think they're 17 or 18 and I'm I'm 31 and I was having a conversation with someone the other day. Like, oh you don't seem as autistic as this other person I don't I'll go into that I don't have their consent to talk about this or anything but um, um so I don't want to put their name out there but um I was like, maybe that's because I've been existing as a person, an adult, for decades longer than they have. They are a teenager. I am, I am middle aged. Um, but like, you learn all these things, and it's the concept of autism spectrum disorder as a as a title, as a nebulous concept, without applying it to autistic people is going to be detrimental and it's going to lead to conversations like that where you're entirely ignoring the nuance of lived experience of, of the autistic people. Does, is, is that sort of Yeah, and, and I, I mean, I was, it, was, it was interesting. It is interesting when we, I've had some conversations recently, fantastic conversations, but trying to get, for instance, non-autistic autism researchers who are really wanting to help reduce the stigma, mm -hmm. right? But that I kept trying to get them to realize there's a massive nuance between reducing stigma towards autism, or reducing stigma autism towards spectrum autistic. disorder, and reducing stigma towards autistic people. So th start thinking of us as a population, as a culture, mm -hmm. and not this abstract disorder that you're trying to reduce the stigma towards. I don't want people to accept autism. I want people to accept autistic Autistics. people. And we, we are a culture. We have our own like shared values. We have our own morals. We have our own social traditions. And the research backs this up. If you're looking at recent autism research and not the research of the 1960s through the 1990s, like research does back this up and everything that we are aligns to being a, a culture. Yeah. Um, 
and it can be a culture and a disability at the same time. Like disabled culture is no less valid than like ethnic cultures or, you know, work cultures. It's it's still something, but the fact that people can conceptualize that autism is as like prescient as it is to to have a culture of its own. And part of my problem with martyr parents and pathology paradigm in particular is um they're depriving the autistic youth of being of, of taking part in their neurocultures i have a um a friend who is is deaf and her parents got her a cochlear implant when she was younger um because they didn't want to for example learn sign um, and she is very angry about it to this day because they deprived her of deaf culture they deprived her of her culture's language. Um, and I think that, and I, I don't want to compare anybody's disabilities to anything else, but like, it looks back to like, well, I don't want, oh, this person's behavior isn't communication, it's not information transfer. It's similar to me as to getting, you know, a child a cochlear implant without their consent because they didn't want to take the time to learn sign. You're not taking the time to understand how this behavior is in a transfer of information or what information they can give you. Um, and the pathology paradigms are not only stigmatizing autistic people, autistic behaviors in the way we exist in the world and impacting our modalities of existence, but they're also depriving people of a really rich and very, very real and alive neuroculture. Yeah. Fantastic. The end. The That's end. That's a great point to leave. Well, no, we still have to do our final, final question, and I can meet and I can introduce you properly to George, um, which is um, so. Thank you, everybody, so so much. I'm glad that we managed to also move away and, and focus on quite positive things because obviously it's quite a tough topic to discuss um, ABA. So I'm quite glad that that. I don't know where we went, but we went there. <laughs> well, but there we were. It was fantastic. Um, so thank you so much, people, for being here. I'm going to ask my favourite question in a minute. Um, just to remind people, so next Saturday we have um, a double empathy session. Oh, yeah, this is my favourite. Um, yeah, so we hopefully we have got uh, Damien Milton who theorised... Wait, you Damien Milton on? Yes. You're not just talking remembers. about... What? <laughs> If he remembers, but Bobby, so Bobby is um, Bobby Elman, also autistic advocate, um, very, very um, knowledgeable and excited about double empathy. So she's going to poke him to remind him that he's on. Um, it's going to be Annette Foster, myself, I'll be chairing it. So I'll try not to talk too much because there'll be a number of us. Um, and I think Kieran Rose as well. So there's a number of us going to be talking about double empathy and just how important it is. And But more than I imagine Damien probably gets frustrated maybe having to just explain double empathy all the, all the time. So I want to talk as well about, well, where can we go with this now? Where can we, what is the future for autistic people um, if we understand double empathy and the double empathy problem between autistic and non-autistic um, people? So that's next week. Um, but for my final question, I don't know if it's changed from last time, JJ, but what is your favorite stim? My favorite stim. Um Last time I answered um, musical stims, like listening to the same song over and over, and my same song changes. Like it was a lot of harmonica banjo stuff. Um, my same song is currently uh, the Dave Matthews Band cover of Sledgehammer. <laughs> okay, I don't know that. It's. Uh, I I implore you to look up the Dave Matthews cover of Sledgehammer. Um, but my question now would be like, some of my stims are intentional. And some of my stims are unintentional. Like I can't control my hand flaps. Um, they come with my emotions and just kind of happen. Um, so do you mean like a stim I would pick? Yeah, what's, even if it's in, I mean, obviously some of our stims can be conscious. A lot of our stims are unconscious. But which one at this point in time do you feel you enjoy the most, whether it's unconscious or not? Um, I'm, I feel like I feel like a lot of it is auditory stimming. It, it, it is music because you know, regardless of of my mood, there is a, a musical stim I can do for that. But I've also um, I've been eating a lot of like I've been trying a lot of different hot sauces and like like um, gustatory stims. I guess you would you would call them are are um, high on on my list right now. Um, there's a there's a brand of hot sauce in the U.S. called Spicy Shark that I've just I, oh, some of them like I have to like 
dip a toothpick into and like <laughs> put it on my tongue. <laughs> I was I was literally about to find that. Thank you, Sai. Um, this probably won't mean anything because you are in America. Um, and salad it's salad cream. Exactly right. So there's those Some of you who are regulars dressing. know about this. So among the modmins of Academy, there is infighting between which is the best condiment, um, mayonnaise or salad cream. Um, salad cream oh, is my favorite. Like it's I have to have multiple bottles, otherwise I get upset that I might run out. And I always used to have it as a child. Like if I went around people's houses, I had to take salad cream with me because I didn't, it's like, I wouldn't use ketchup. I wouldn't, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So trying to explain what salad cream is, is quite difficult because you don't really have it. Um, I think a couple of Americans who are in the UK have tried to explain and Annette did that it's like Miracle Whip, but not so sweet. It's not so sugary. It's quite, it's quite vinegary. Um, but it's kind of thick like mayonnaise. It's so hard to explain. Tangy mayo. So Tanya's trying to say tangy mayo. Um, lots of it people say sounds better than mayo to me, honestly. Yeah, mayo's, yeah. See, the team salad cream is very small, so you're welcome to join team salad cream. <laughs> um, it's just this jokey thing. But what's amazing is one of our um, Academy social members, thank you, Sai, <laughs> one of our um, Academy social members was bored, so they made like um, a PowerPoint on the history of salad cream. It's just, it was amazing. I was just like, this is very exciting. Um, so yeah, it's just this random thing. But yeah, so spicy things for you. Spicy things right now are a big stim. And also like I went to the carnival the other day and like I I feel like proprioceptive stimming is also up there. Um, like this, the spinny rides are just, top tier for me um i cried on the ferris wheel like i can't i can't but like the spinny rides like the one where it's i, I don't know you like go around in a circle but it's like this and then you go backwards and like the cart itself swings and and that's for me like i really want the history of carnival rides to be a special interest for me but it just you can't pick your spin <laughs> Maybe if you looked into it, you'd find something and you'd get hooked. It's hard it. to find books about it. I've been looking. I'm like, ah. <laughs> because mechanics is a, is a special interest, and I feel like that that is just so niche. That um, so I feel free to take off the mayonnaise um, thing on the screen. <laughs> so um, and I'm just going to introduce everybody to George. I've decided to call him George Victoria. So um, he was made by Victoria, who's one of our modmins. Um, and I was just like, I need this in my life when she put pictures up. And so she kindly sent me here. And he's like made of, I don't usually like felt or wool. It makes me really, yeah, exactly, no, right? No, but this is actually no. quite lovely. It's not, actually, if I rubbed it too much, it wouldn't be. But he's just so beautiful. And he's just, and I, I quite like um, olfactory senses as well. So. I'll be obviously very sense avoidant if it's like a really strong, disgusting smell. But if it's something really lovely, so I kind of sprayed him with a bit of perfume so I can sniff him. But he's lovely. Look at him. He's wonderful. And she, that's like such talent. Holy cow. I know. And his arms, and I mean, there's too much light there. So his arms and his legs move with little buttons. It's little buttons. It's fantastic. But I want one that's like a possum. I love giraffes, but autism brain decided that I love possums and tell you like all of a sudden. So, <laughs> oh, so lovely, um, lovely. So, thank you, lovely, lovely people for being here. We're going to leave with our um, okay. outro music uh, by Paul Wadey, and we will see you next week. <laughs> Bye, y'all.